Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Uh, my partner, John Coleman, and I have a very special guest today, and we're looking forward to you meeting her. Yeah, Art, uh, this is an interesting situation. Uh, you are a friend of our guest, Liz Sterling, and you met her how? Digitally. <laughs> uh, you know, this old dog, uh, I guess, learned some new tricks. Uh, what's really fascinating is, uh, particularly on LinkedIn, uh, there are all sorts of fascinating people that I run across, either in, in uh, professional groups or just every so often you read something in a feed. And there was something about uh, Liz, first of all, she's in our business, but uh, she was from uh, across the pond. Uh, I, I hadn't heard anything from her yet, but she was across the pond. But she then, uh, after a, a really nice career in uh, 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 the broadcast industry, she came to the U.S. and she started reinventing herself. And we love people who reinvent themselves. Right. Uh, and uh, well, we'll get into a little bit more what happened, but especially when about a year and a half ago when COVID hit, and she was sort of so quarantined for a whole variety of reasons that we'll get into. She didn't know whether she had COVID or not, but she started giving a diary back in March, I think of a year, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, yeah. and talking about what it's like going through, not understanding what's going on. So she's really a fascinating person. Uh, well, what, and, are, uh, what, uh, what I picked up on, which I was fascinated by, because both you and I have been in, um, film television production for you for 20 years me for 50 years mm. um i picked up on the fact that she was a professional working all around the world she's worked for i don't know nbc bbc discovery channel she's been in production in just about every country from what i gather um and here she is as a act two generation <laughs> person and she's uh, reinventing herself, uh, working, still working in the industry for mm. folks like you and me and, and networks and things, but she's reinvented herself at this young, tender age, yeah. <laughs> over 50. So I'm dying to meet her. You know her pretty well. Have you ever met her in person, by the way? I have. I have not. Uh, and in fact, uh, only a, a couple of weeks ago, we actually spoke to one another for the first time. It's all been electronic. We have an electronic relationship <laughs> that is now going on to something else. So, you know what? Why don't we bring Liz in? So she I think can, it's time. You're right. Uh, you know, fix anything that we've screwed up. Hi, Good. Liz. Hi, what an introduction, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, it, look, it's showbiz Liz Sterling. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do I have that right, Liz? You, you, your nickname is showbiz Liz? Yeah, that was an affectionate uh, nickname that my colleagues at the BBC many moons ago gave me um, because of all the showbiz sort of like stories and celebrities that I used to work with and uh, lots of interesting stuff that I can get into another time for another episode, probably not not right here. But uh, yeah, so that name's just followed me for so long. So yeah, that's, that's what they right. call me. It's a great name, by the way. What, I, what, I'd, like, what I'd like to start off with is uh, before we get to your latest reinvention, which is absolutely fascinating. And it's so timely. Most of our things are not so timely, but it will be, people will understand in a moment. But what brought you from, you reinvented yourself when you went from uh, uh, across the pond, as uh, we refer to it, as you refer to it sometimes, to the US, and not really mm -hmm. knowing a whole bunch of people here. What caused you to come here in the first place uh, what, uh, several years ago? Well, that's an interesting story, Art, because I used to come here to the US um, and produce different content for the BBC. And I just realized that there, there was a real gap in the market for somebody like me here uh, in America. So, you know, in production, understands the UK, understands the US, and really just being that conduit, you know, between the two, the two territories. And um, I just voiced my idea one day and I got great feedback for it. You know, when I said, hey, you know, I really think I really want to have a fixer in the States because you guys didn't have fixers. Um, they're known elsewhere in um, other parts of the world. And although sort of now it's like a, it can be seen as like a derogatory term because, you know, fixer, what do they do? Um, at the time, 
I just saw a real need for it in, in the States. And um, I left the BBC after I pitched an idea, uh, a music documentary that I wanted to make. And the BBC just were like, OK, go, go up and make your show. So I came to the States with that particular project because it was following a, a Scottish singer-songwriter on his attempt to break into the industry. His name is Paolo Nettini. And Paul and I had known each other for years. So, um, so yeah, came to the States with him, set up my company, Vote Media Fix, and pretty much never looked back. So now I take Americans to other parts of the world, um, but I also still obviously we have a lot of overseas clients that come to the States with their productions. Everything from like, you, you said it yourself, John, like NBC, yeah. Discovery, Amazon, BBC, I still do a lot of business with them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, pretty much every platform and network. You, you know, Liz, I, I think... Uh... Most people, we're all in, in quote, the business. So yeah. we know what it looks like behind the camera. Um, but mm -hmm. most people see a scene, a movie, a television show, whatever it is, they see two, three, maybe five people in front of the camera. They don't realize that there's probably 20 times as many people behind the camera, um, whether they're actually on set while the camera, or the film is rolling or not. It takes a, a huge crew to make a, a production. And... Uh, there's all kinds of specialties, and and I, I love the word fixer, <laughs> and you're right. It's not an American term. We don't know what a fixer is, but in in my world, that's a that's a production liaison. That's a person who just makes it happen. You know, whatever it yeah. needs, mm -hmm. you'll find a way to make it happen. Yeah, and that's I find, Sorry, I I find it fascinating. Yeah, and what I noticed when I used to come here back in like. The early 200s, the, the late 1990s, early 2000s, was that we have, Eng we're all speaking English, but even American English and British English are very different in, often in times, but even more so in production. Like we have different names for the same thing, right? So, and quite often that can cause a lot of confusion. So, I wanted to specialize in knowing because I knew both sides of it. So, you know, it's like, all my friends go, oh my God, that was such a great idea, Liz, and you're the, the original fixer in the States. and it just grew from there. My my company's now like 15 years old um, uh, from when I first started it. Like I say, I started with the Paolo uh, Nutini documentary and then it just kind of went on from there. What What, what is the, the, the name of the, the main company that you operate under? Um, Volt Media Fix is my company. Volt, Volt Media Fix. Fix, right. yeah. Because, you're, um, because you know, you're the fixer. Yeah, and because, and Volt, because, you know, it's, Everyone knows how energetic I am, you know, and it's like a, you know, it's like a, <laughs> you know, I've got this boundless energy. Um, so uh, it kind of fits my personality. Okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, uh, lead us down to uh, the reinvention of Liz Sterling once again uh, in the age of COVID. And it was a, there's some really amazing stuff that you're doing. You've actually become an expert on this in the production side and to be able to help people. But could you uh, give a, a, a brief uh, background of how you got involved with COVID and learned about it and then what you're doing with it? So can you, because you've, you've taken uh, something which uh, uh, many of us just got locked away at home and said, well, what were we gonna do? And you not only faced it and addressed it, but you turned it into an opportunity. So can right. you give us a little right. bit of background about how the, all that came about? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, basically, I got an early indication of COVID, um, which I don't have to get into too much now, but I got an email that basically started with, if you're reading this, it's because I care about you. And it was coming from a very valid source. And I just felt this was like the 10th of March 2020. And I just felt incredibly helpless in that moment. And after like a couple of days of pacing around my living room, it just dawned on me, you know, like any, you know, good producer, you just start to think of a solution um, and think of how can we get, get through this? And so I decided to focus on business recovery. And so when everyone else was just kind of sitting around thinking, oh, this is going to pass in a few weeks, I decided to go back to college. So I signed up for epidemics classes, virology classes, global communicable diseases classes, track and trace classes, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. And I really sort of, I spent six months solidly um, studying. And then I remember, I, you know, you probably saw on LinkedIn and places like that, I was sort of putting out my certifications. And just one day I just started getting phone calls from like Sony Studios and Amazon and 
and they were like, we really need someone like you who has who's a producer, but who also has this COVID optic. Um, and it just kind of started off from there. You know, I just uh, I started crafting programs for celebrities like Tyra Banks, um, you know, and like like I say, other studios, and and then looking at their productions and and being able to have a macro view of it and tell them where they had might have problems, uh, coming up with some solutions. And sharing a lot of data, a lot of scientific data. I mean, I follow a lot of virologists and um, a lot of people on, on Twitter. Like, that's where I get a lot of my research from because a lot of the papers from around the world are published on there. And really just, I mean, I was fascinated with that. I really found it incredibly interesting because it's the most, it's the biggest thing that's ever happened in our history. And so it's important to, like, really address it. Um, but from a business recovery point of view, that's what I decided to focus on. Now, now yes. you also, you also, in addition to uh, uh, consulting to uh, companies and individuals, um, and that that is a main part of your business right now, is helping them navigate recovering pro into the production world, the live production world, uh, from uh, safely uh, in this continuing age of COVID, not only in the U.S. but around the world. But you also decided to, which another fascinating piece of your reinvention is to do a documentary about a particular country that seemed to have uh, bypassed most of the problems with COVID. Uh, can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, so when I was studying, I had to do a lot of papers on the 1918 pandemic, right? So I was looking at these amazing stories from back then and just it just fascinated me and I thought, huh, we should make, be making stories about this pandemic so in 50 years' time people can look back and learn from it. Uh, and just, you know, I just found it really, really great storytelling. So I started looking around and, you know, I'm tracking every country, right? And I noticed um, I kind of got a little bit of a tip off about uh, Fiji. The country was sealed off. They, they were one of the very few countries that used the military to seal their country off. But um, they had no covid and I just uh, had a kind of light bulb moment one day when I was uh, sitting on the beach with one of my crew. I'd just done a shoot in Hawaii. And I just sort of like started telling him the story. And he was like, that's amazing, Liz. You should, you should definitely go and do that. And we looked at the calendar that day and realized in order for me to go there to mark the one year anniversary of no COVID in Fiji, I'd have to get on a plane within the next 72 hours because you've got to do the, the quarantine, right? The mandatory military quarantine. And I thought, oh, wow, it's going to be a year. And this is amazing. So the story began in that moment. And, and the effort it took me to get to Fiji is a story in itself, um, which we're, we're going into it in the dock. But um, I had the clock was ticking, right? I had 72 hours to figure out a way to get there. Convinced the, the country to let me in. I started you know, calling up the prime minister's office and like just the sheer effort. And part of it was like, you know, I was under siege in, in Los Angeles, as you remember, it was really bad. And I, you know, you're you're totally isolated, living on your own. And a part of it was that, you know, that feeling of I could get some freedom, I could be with other people, it's gonna be amazing. And, and also tell this fantastic story, figure out how did they manage to avoid getting COVID in the country. So um, eventually, you know, by, sheer effort and, and all of my like will I got into the country it was unbelievable the stuff that happened I was in two weeks quarantine you know the prime minister was coming in my was going to come in my um court in my um resort the place where I was quarantined on the year of COVID free Fiji I was getting out of quarantine that day it was going to be amazing and then I get out and on the very day that the country was set about to celebrate no COVID Fiji the virus breached the, the, the border. And so the whole story just takes an incredible turn. And I got locked in the country. You know, I went from one lockdown searching for freedom and, and some answers how they managed to do it to go right back into uh, another lockdown. And it kind of felt like this virus is just chasing me around the planet, you know? Um, so yeah, that's uh, something, that's my passion project that I'm working on right now. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> Um, you know, Liz, it's interesting um, that uh, 
you and and Art and I all have the same frame of reference uh, to production, to to film, television, media production, uh, cameras and things like that. Most people don't really understand that. Explain to folks how the business of making media changed with COVID. I mean, beforehand, you know, you'd have 20, 30 people hanging around. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, not only are the people wearing masks, but the actors have to deal with it. And there's a whole different protocol. Of course, that's your business now. Explain, explain how it's different. Well, I mean, I guess the way it's different is, I mean, obviously we all know that productions, uh, the teams got smaller as well, right? The production values on camera changed as well. Like before we had to have all these, you know, great, you know, satellite trucks and, you know, cameras and lights and the whole, now it's much more condensed and the production values, um, sort of lesser production values are acceptable. You know, people don't mind so much that there's, you know, uh, you can stream now from a backpack. Uh, you don't need a big satellite truck. Um, which I did recently at COP26 um, in Glasgow, the climate conference. I did a whole broadcast there for TikTok, and we did it pretty much from these uh, incredible pieces of equipment that's just in a backpack. Um, there's a lot of interest in, like, confidentiality things have gone away. Like, now we know the ages of all of your celebrities because we all have to see their vaccination cards. <laughs> and we have to... Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's no hiding that anymore. Um and, you know, like, the, you have to build in this time now. Um, like, yeah, every, every shoot that I do now, uh, obviously, I look at it before I uh, build a budget out and because I, I have to factor in these COVID costs. Um, everyone has to be vaccinated. Everyone has to be tested. Um, you know, that time has to be built into the day now. Um, and obviously, now we now have these, these COVID officers um, who are they're solely there as an independent person to to oversee and make sure the set is safe and people are complying with these protocols um i'm i'm a real stickler for having a person on on location because everyone's got a job to do as you know yourself uh, john that there's lots of hats that we wear you can't be wearing the covid hat and also producing at the same time someone else has to do that and that person has to have just as much right to to stop uh, a set um, and shut it down as anyone else because they're there purely in an independent um, capacity. That would never happen in the past, right? That person at that sort of pay rate would never normally be able to tell a producer or director, okay, we're, I'm shutting down the show, but we have to accept that that's, they're there to do a job to keep everyone safe. And, and you know, now it's like, my whole thing is like, I'm trying to keep people in work. I want people to be able to keep a roof over their head. We're fortunate to be in this business. Um, it's a very blessed business to be in, but you know, if you get if you get COVID, you might not die now, you know, because we're all getting vaccinated, boosted, and all that good stuff. But you can't walk for two weeks, and that's just you know, I'm a real stickler for making sure people can keep the show on the road. Yeah, it it, it really did um, add a, a tremendously thick layer of complications to making media to filming um uh, mm -hmm. television or film um and and boy we all we all understand it i don't think the public you know the, let's face it the public's worried about themselves they're not worried about how you make a movie um yeah so but it's totally doable john it's completely doable like one of the things i did was i was consulting for amazon they asked me to come in an executive capacity to oversee um several other productions and have oversight for them um, other production companies were making these shows, but I was there purely as the eyes and ears of the network, if you like. Um, and we, I mean, we delivered um, Rihanna's Savage Fenty, the season three of Savage Fenty, which is a huge show for Rihanna. And there was 700 personnel on that mm -hmm. production and we had zero problems with COVID because we just, you know, you just get really good protocols in place. I mean... We had a whole, it was like a whole machine, right? People would get multiple tests before they started on working. They'd, you know, they'd come in every day. We had proximity devices so that if, we, if I pass by you, that information is, is logged. And so if someone mm. tests positive, we can run a report and go, huh, okay, so this person walked past 50 people and you can quickly take those people out and then obviously get them all tested and quarantined. But we had no issues because we had such good protocols in place going into the production 
Um, same same with Lizzo. We did a, a series, a new series for Lizzo, which is about to come out, and like two hundred people on that. We we were totally fine. Yeah. Again, all of the COVID protocols were in place. You have an independent team who are just focused on that, and you know we delivered everything safe, and people kept working, and no one got sick. Right, mm. right. Um, I love. Uh, I lo of course, our audience, as you know, Liz, our audience is uh, over fifty. We're, we're talking mm -hmm. to the uh, Act Two generation, people who mm -hmm. are have hit quote fifty years old, being you know the the beginning of the second half of your life. Um, so I'm always fascinated by folks you know, over 50, who have the courage, because sometimes it does take a lot of courage, to look forward and change their lives. Change, And you've not only changed your life, your business, but you've changed a lot of other people's lives by being able to provide this service for media production. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it about you, do you suppose, that gave you this... I don't know what it is, attitude that just says, hey, something needs fixing and I'm going to fix it. Of course. <laughs> You're going to fix it. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Um, well, I'm Scottish and we're stoic by nature, I would say. Um, or as Eckhart Tolle said in one of his books, Scotland has a high pain body. So I think I think Scottish people in their DNA have this, like, you know, we're used to, like, pushing through it in hard times. Um, my brothers, I mean, I'm the youngest of a household of boys, right? I'm the baby, I'm the rock star baby sister, as my brothers call me. But they always said that I embody my um, family crest, the uh, motto. Uh, and if you look up the Sterling clan, it quite clearly says gang forward. And my brothers have always said, that's totally you, Elizabeth. You are always pushing forward. Um, I guess I have to give my parents a little bit of credit for that because they always gave me a can do anything <laughs> if you put your mind to it. Uh, but I just, you know, I've always said I want to live a good life. And sometimes if you lean, in, lean into the troubled times, and don't get me wrong, you know, like everybody out there, I've had, this, you know, the dark days and art, seen some of them on my videos, but I just somehow, I, I can sort of tell myself mentally, come on, Elizabeth, come on, Liz, you know, pull your socks up, you know, get on with it. Because you woke up this morning and you have everything you need as soon as you take your head off the pillow. Good point. And of course, as we get older, it change does become harder for a lot of people. Um, and you're a baby. You're only in your fifties. Yes. Come on, Liz. Well I, yeah. <laughs> well, I just like I just I mean I don't know. I just think that you can either be you can let life pass you by, or you can really just you know you can enjoy it. You can like um, Bill Hicks is one of my heroes, right? And Bill Hicks has this great. Um, he did this amazing um, skit or stand-up when he was dying, but no one else knew he was dying, right? He had cancer. Yeah. But he talks about life just being a ride, and it goes up and down and round and round. And in, in the end, you just get off the ride. So you can either enjoy it, you know, or not. But I just that always stuck with me because then I found out, obviously, he knew he was dying and he didn't tell anyone. Yeah. But it was it really, that was a student when I saw that, and I just loved it. So I kind of thought, he's right. I'm going to live my life. And enjoy, you know, the ups and the downs just as much as, you know, as he obviously did, you know. So I kind of always try and live my life like that. And, you know, if you don't have the bad stuff, you don't know you've got the good stuff and vice versa. So every day is just, every day is just, um, it's an uh, opportunity for adventure. And definitely that's what I think. But, um, you know, I've, I've been lucky to have a career that allows me to do that, right? But I think you can do that no matter what, what world you're in. Well, you know what I have to I have to say, Liz, that uh, uh, first of all, every so often you get lucky. Uh, you you were started out to be an electronic friend. Now at least we're analog friends, and and in some of the conversations we've had, and I look forward to having many more of them, both privately and perhaps on air. I know that uh, uh, not only are you here, but you've got uh, a son in the navy. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got you, you've got a really a fascinating. A broad spectrum uh, life uh, that people can just see the pieces of, uh, but the most important piece, and uh, I think it was most ably demonstrated here, is that you shouldn't be afraid to invent, reinvent yourself. And even with the worst concept of what's going on or not going on, uh, in this particular case with COVID back in the early days of uh, 2020, 
uh, rather than feel sorry for yourself. And you probably spent a couple of hours. On, I did watch virtually every video that you, you put out during that period of time in the early days. Is that you looked at it and you said, okay, this sucks. But it does for everybody else. So maybe I can help them. Maybe there's something not necessarily just for yourself to reinvent yourself. But you looked at it and you said, you know what? There's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm beginning to see it. And I think I can share it with other people to help them. And that's, I mean, that was sort of the beginning of our, if you will, relationship uh, yep. of, of why we got, I got excited and John is excited about having uh, the opportunity to meet you and talk to you because you reinvented yourself and you're moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, thanks guys. Well, I, like I say, I just, I really cared for people and I really wanted to help and I knew that no one else could tell me what it was because no one knew what it was. So I just thought I want to focus on this and see if I can help people through it. And, um, and you know, along the way, I was a little bit entertaining because I know I had some, I told some of my fix and diaries in some of those uh, videos. Uh, and that's another, so maybe that's for another episode where we can talk about some of those crazy showbiz days. But um, yeah, I'm, I just want to help people. That's what's really driving me. Yeah, well, I want to thank you because you are among those people that helped the industry, our industry, television, film, media, production, get back to work. Yeah, yeah, I know, because we, we remember the crash of 2008, John, and at the time that felt horrific, right? But we had to come through that. So I, I knew, like, we're, we're all, this is totally survivable. It just requires some, um, you know, problem solving. And you know, like I say, any good producer will put their, their uh, problem solving hat on and, and that's what I did. I, I wanted to marry the scientific health um, world with the production world so that we could, um, you know, we could get back to work. And here we are yeah. um, heading into Omicron. But that's another story. We'll uh, see how we get on a um, okay. couple of months time. Well, we'll have, we'll have to have more uh, conversations. Uh, uh, I would love to uh, 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 talk to you. Uh, but just because it's your story is so fascinating. I think maybe we should do another episode. We'll talk about it uh, so as to get off the air. But uh, you've got such an amazing uh, uh, background uh, with the BBC and things like that. I'm sure there are some wonderful stories about people who slammed doors, doors in your face and you didn't take the, uh, uh, no for an answer. I, I know there's actually some of that. And perhaps we can get together again and share that with our audience. But in any now, event... Until, yeah, until ahead, that time... Until that time, Liz, mm -hmm. where do we follow you? On Facebook, on Twitter? Where where do we reach you? Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, it's easy to find me on LinkedIn because I'm showbiz Liz Sterling uh, on Instagram. Instagram's like my little kind of, it's more uh, my sort of alter ego, my showbiz Liz. So it's just, I think it's showbiz underscore Liz. And that's just more a little bit like, you know, fun stuff that Liz does. And then um, Facebook, I'm, I'm Liz Sterling. And obviously my website, Vault Media Fix. Um, you know, you can find me. I'm definitely out there. Good. Well, it, I got to say, it's wonderful to meet you. And uh, thank you for all you've done for getting the uh, media industry back to work. A lot of people were hurting. Um, I know we we talk in the news, of course. Uh, we heard about all these other industries, retail and whatever, being uh, restaurants being hurt by the COVID. Uh, people didn't talk about the behind the scenes of media production, but it was it was hit very hard, and uh, it's good to see all these people back to work now in totally different ways. You know, using remote cameras and Zoom and things like that. But still, good to be back to work. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, guys. It was really nice chatting with you. I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, great. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.